Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's panel discussion on monkeypox virus, or MPV for short. My name is Lewis Finley. I'm a reporter with New York One. You can catch me on mornings on one at the desk pre presenting more in-depth stories or occasionally out in the field. Uh, we first, we want to thank everyone for attending tonight and for submitting your questions in advance. If you haven't submitted your question yet, you can use the Q&A feature throughout the event to submit your questions to one or all of our panelists. If we don't get to your question tonight, Callan Lord will be compiling all the questions to create a comprehensive FAQ as a follow-up to this event. So please keep tabs of their website and social media at Callan Lord on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Lastly, a recording of this event will also be uploaded online. So let's get started. Tonight, we'll be discussing what we know about the current outbreak of MPV, including symptoms, transmission, treatment, and prevention. We'll also be responding to your questions about all of this and more. Our panel tonight will be Dr. Ashwin Vassen, He's the commissioner of New, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I believe he is uh, on his way, but uh, I want to also get to some of our other panelists. We have uh, Dr. Peter Meacher. He's the chief uh, medical officer at Cal and Lord. Uh, can you please introduce yourself with your pronouns and tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter, Peter Meacher. He and him are my pronouns. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Callan Lord, and I'm a family physician by training. I've been working in LGBT health my entire career and very much looking forward to this discussion. So important for us to get the right information out to community. Thank you for being here. Next up, we have Dr. Asa Radix, uh, the Senior Director of Research and Education at Cal and Lord with us tonight. If you could introduce yourself, your pronouns, and tell us a little bit about yourself. There, I was muted, sorry. Hi, everyone, I'm Asa Radix. Um, as you heard, I'm the Senior Director of Research and Education. My training is um, in infectious disease. And um, I run the research department at Cal and Lord, and I'm really happy to be here and I'm glad all of you are here as well. Next up, we have Dr. Marcus Sandling. He's the Senior Director of Research and Education at Cal and Lord. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your pronouns, and uh, why you're here tonight. Uh, just a quick update. I'm actually a Clinical Director of Sexual Health. Um, so I help um, with managing our sexual health program at Cal and Lord. I'm an infectious disease doctor by training and have been working at Cal and Lord for the past three years. And pronouns are he and and last but not least, we have Fernando. He's a patient at Cal and Lord who'll be sharing his experiences with the monkeypox virus. Uh, Fernando, can you introduce yourself, your pronouns, and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, good afternoon. My name is Fernando. I am 48 years old. I, um, I was born in Mexico, but I've been here half of my life and I work for New York State. Um, I'm here to uh, share my experience about monkeypox and my pronouns are him and his. And I, I wanna circle back to Dr. Uh, Vassan. He is here, if you could introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you hope to gain from tonight. Thanks everyone. My name is Ashwin Vassan. I'm the 44th Commissioner of Health of New York City. It's an honor to be here amongst you all and with you all in community. My pronouns are he, him. Um, a little bit about myself, I'm a father of three. Um, I started my career, I spent the first uh, 10, 12 years of my career working in global HIV AIDS, um, mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa and um, in Haiti and, and, and other places. Um, and so the issues that are coming up now um, for um, the LGBTQ, um, the MSM community around um, monkeypox are of uh, personal importance to me as a, as a clinician, as someone, as a public health advocate, and as someone who um, cares deeply about health and human rights. And so uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm here to I'll first learn, um, listen, um, but also to take any questions and, and of course, try to um, give you a better sense of 
what the city's trying to do and, and in these challenging circumstances. We'll be hearing from all of our panelists, but I first wanna start with uh, Fernando. Can you tell me a little bit about what your experience has been like when you realized that you had monkeypox and what it's been like so far in, in your journey? Sure, I'm gonna start from the beginning. <clears throat> So uh, my name is um, Fernando. I am 48 years old. I was born in Mexico and I have been living in New York City half of my life. I have a nine to five office job for a New York State agency. And I consider myself to be a healthy person, a healthy man. I go to the gym, I eat healthy, I don't do drugs. I do not attend sex parties. And when it comes to sex, I usually prefer to have one or two consistent partners to avoid diseases or infections. So I'm going to start um, talking about my experience. <clears throat> um, Friday, June 17th, I had my first sexual encounter with Nick. Saturday, June 18th, I had my second sexual encounter with Nick. Monday, June 20th, I had my third sexual encounter with Nick. Wednesday, June 22nd. The evening of June 22nd, we were supposed to, to get together again. But that morning, I had to cancel because I noticed for the first time a bump on my anus. I thought it was hemorrhoid and I started to treat it as a hemorrhoid, but, I, but it didn't go away. Friday, June 24th, exactly a week from the day that I got infected, I noticed a second bump also on my anus and right next to the first one. That same day when I was at work, like right after noon, I started feeling sick. I started feeling tiredness, body aches, headache, and chills in that order. The chills were so intense that at least twice I had to go to the bathroom and let hot water run on my hands just to give my body some, some temperature. That Friday, I left work at 5 p.m. and I got home around 6 p.m. All I remember is opening the door, kicking off my shoes and falling into bed. After that, I couldn't get out of bed. I was sick. I was still feeling the same body aches, the tiredness, headache, the chills, but now I also had fever, 101.5. I took, um, I was thinking that it was COVID. So I took a home rapid test, which came out negative. That evening before going to bed, that Friday, I started taking Motrim, still thinking that it might, might have been COVID. Motrim controlled all the symptoms that I was feeling. So I kept taking Motrim all throughout the weekend, which happened to be Pride weekend. That was Friday, June 24th. Um, Saturday, June 25th, and Sunday, June 26th. That Saturday, June 25th, I got a third bump, also on my anus, also right next to the other two. That Saturday, June 25th, I went out and I got tested for COVID. I got the PCR test, which also came back negative. By Monday, June 27th, I was already sick. Even with Motrim, I was already feeling very sick. I went to Colin Lord looking for help because I knew that I was sick. I just didn't know what it was. At this point, I knew that it wasn't COVID. So I assumed that it was an STD. When I saw the nurse practitioner, because I couldn't see a doctor, I will never forget her expression. When she saw me, when she took a look at my butt, right there, I knew that whatever I had, it was serious. She suggested that I should get tested for COVID, for all STDs, but also for monkeypox. The nurse practitioner told me that the bumps that I, that I was feeling on my anus, they weren't just on outside my anus, they were all, all the way inside. That part I didn't know, but that explains why I was feeling all this pain already. I wasn't given anything. She told me to go home and I went home. By 4, 5 p.m. that Monday, the rash started on my body. 
I got rashes on my torso, on my legs, my arms, and my face. And my anus kept getting more and more and more painful. The next day, Tuesday, June 28th, some of my, some of my test results came back and I tested positive for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Against my doctor's advice, I ran to the clinic because I knew I was very sick. I was, I, I was feeling like dying. So I went to the clinic and I got treated for gonorrhea and chlamydia. At this point, I already knew that I had monkeypox. I had a rash on my body. The next day, Wednesday, June 29th, Dr. Chan, on behalf of the Department of Health, saw me via Zoom at 1 p.m. And after he saw me, he decided that I needed to get a treatment right away. By this point on Wednesday, when I saw the doctor, I had already survived the worst and most painful three days of my life. That Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, June 27th to the 29th, I could feel all three viruses inside me, nesting, destroying, and feeding from inside and outside my anus. I was bleeding. I can even describe the pain that I was feeling, but it was a pain that I never felt before and I never wanna feel again. Also, the virus, uh, monkeypox, somehow it affected my metabolism because it kept sending me to the bathroom. It was sending me to the bathroom at least five times during the night and some, somewhere between eight to 10 times during the day. And every time I went, nothing came out. Most of the times, all I got was blood and the pain. I don't have to say that every time I went to the bathroom, I was crying and yelling in pain. That Wednesday, after I saw the doctor at 1 p.m. via Zoom, he sent the medication and I got it within a few hours. So I started the treatment on Wednesday, June 29th at 8 p.m. I was told to take 600 milligrams of tecovirimat every, every 12 hours. That Wednesday afternoon, right before I started the treatment, the first rashes that I got on my body, especially the ones on my right arm, on my face, and the one on my, on my penis were already big. They were becoming like little balls, little bumps that were extremely painful. I had one on the top of my right eye that was growing so big, it was making my whole eye red and it was beginning to, to close my eye, to shut it down. The next day, after taking the first dose of the medication on Thursday, June 30th, I woke up at 7 a.m. feeling a little better. But just to give you an idea of the type of pain that I was feeling, on a scale from one to 100, before the medication, my pain was 110. After taking the treatment for the first time, the pain went down to 95. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that I was still in a lot of pain. It was very painful, even with the medication. But before the medication, the pain was unbearable. The next day, Thursday, after taking the medication for the first time, I only saw like five more new rushes on my body. And then the following day, Friday, I only saw one more. And after taking the treatment for the first time, the rushes that I had, Immediate, immediately started to dry out. Once I started taking the treatment, I was dealing with different kinds of pains. I was dealing with the, with the internal pain on my anus. I was also dealing with external pain on my anus, the body aches. But now I was also feeling another pain that the, um, I believe the treatment was giving me, which was uh, on the lymph nodes which was also giving me pain on my legs. I couldn't get out of bed. It was impossible for me to get out of bed. Also, while taking the medication, I experienced different side effects on different days. For example, one day I had a headache, a couple of days I had fever and body aches, but really the main side effect that I experienced was tiredness and weakness. 
and a very painful lymph node in the groin that I could that made me not being able to get out of bed. The following days, the rash stopped completely, and whatever rash I had left on my body it started to dry out. But still, I was in bed, unable to get out of bed. By Friday, July 8th, that was the first day that I actually felt better because I finally got some energy back and I was able to get out of bed and I, I was actually able to run to the store to get some more food. It has been a struggle all these days, um, but I'm thankful that I got the medication, the treatment that I needed. Um, I can only say that I needed it before the time that it was given to me because by the time I got it, I was already very sick. Today, my energy is back. My skin is still clearing. I still have the scars on my skin and my butt is still healing. I think my butt is the one thing that's gonna need more time because that one bump that I got, the first one on Wednesday, the 22nd, is still there and still bleeding. So basically right now, I'm just waiting today, tonight is my, my last dose of the treatment at 8 p.m. and I feel more, much better and I'm just waiting for my body to heal complete, completely. Thank you. Well, Fernando, first, thank you for being so brave and telling us and sharing your story. Uh, just quickly before we move on to uh, some questions for the panel, other panelists, um, what's your big takeaway or your big message for people who might be uh, struggling right now, um, whether it's getting medicine or getting the vaccine? Um, well, I mean, I do. I did come up with three suggestions based on my experience. I'm going to read them to you. I don't know if that's going to answer your question, but based on my experience, I would tell the, the community right now to take a two or three week break from hooking up. Just let things cool down for a little bit. Also, if somebody really has to hook up, then ask for the proof of vaccination. That's the only way to be safe. Um, in my experience, it's hard to tell when somebody has monkeypox because you can just get the first rush and it can be very tiny, very small in a hidden part of your body and you don't know what it is. It's hard to tell. So you ask for the vaccine. And then, and then also in my experience, like I said, I do not go to sex parties. I do not go around hooking up with everybody. I was only seeing one person. So from now on, my big takeaway is that if I was careful before, I'm gonna be extra careful in the future. I'm gonna make sure that the people I'm seeing are honest, are uh, decent, and, and they're also 100% exclusive. Uh, I don't wanna be with somebody that's having sex with the whole city. Well, thank you again for sharing your story. Um, I really appreciate it. And thank you for being so brave and, and open with us. You're welcome. Um, I want to get to some of the other panelists. Uh, let's start at the basics here. Uh, for people who don't know what this is, what exactly is monkeypox? And what do we know about this outbreak right now? So I think I can answer that question. Um, so, you know, monkeypox uh, virus is not that common. I think that's the first thing to say. You know, it, it is part of a, it is a pox virus. It's part of the orthopox virus family. Um, you may have heard of smallpox, which was eradicated in the 1970s. It was part of that family. Also related to cowpox and um, horsepox, actually. And it's generally uh, an, an, illness that's, you know, it's rare, but when it was seen, it was seen usually in Central and West Africa. And it was and usually thought that it didn't spread that uh, frequently. But then again, in, uh, in May, we started to see cases and those were in Spain and Belgium in the UK. Um, and they were found to be occurring in people who had attended 
um, various uh, parties. So what we what we do know is, and I think probably um, Dr. Mitra may may speak of this a little bit later, but um, that it generally seems to be spread through uh, contact, so skin to skin contact. Um, these parties that happened in Spain and in Belgium and in the UK happened to um, be parties that were predominantly involving, um, you know, gay and bisexual men, but really anyone uh, can get monkeypox. It's, it's just about skin to skin contact. So when you say skin to skin contact, we, we covered sex. What about other ways? I've heard kissing. Um, what about sweat? Uh, I've heard linens. Can you talk a little bit about some of the other ways that it can be spread as well? Yes. Yeah, so skin to skin contact, kissing, also contact with uh, clothing that has uh, the fluid from the, you know, from the sores, the blisters um, that can happen. It's not thought to be spread through, um, through air at, at you know, long distances, the way that, for example, COVID-19 is. So we, we don't know very much. I mean, people often ask about like, uh, other fluids like semen. We're, we're not that sure. Yes, it has been isolated. The virus has been isolated from semen. But um, again, that may not be a, a predominant route of spread because, you know, every, you know the largest uh, organ in our body is our skin. And that, that's the one that's going to get the contact. So what are some of the symptoms, uh, this is for anyone in the panel, what are some of the symptoms of MPV? We heard some of the symptoms that Fernando has gone through, but uh, maybe Peter, you could talk a little bit about this. Um, and what are you seeing when people come in um, with presumed monkeypox? Sure. Um, so we're seeing a, a very wide range of symptoms from a very mild uh, a set of symptoms to something much more severe. Um, typically, many of the things Fernando described are part of the picture. Fever, headache, muscle aches, exhaustion, swollen lymph nodes. Um, these may occur first or at the same time as the rash. And the rash may start like a, a just a, one small pimple in fact, I've had people uh, explain they thought it was an ingrown hair, you know, a very small uh, uh, pimple. But then soon after, the single pimple becomes multiple pimples and there are blisters. Uh, they sometimes run together. They're sometimes painful even early on or later in the evolution of the, the, the course of the illness. Um, some patients seem to quickly develop a lot of pain, especially at the site of inoculation, the, uh, the part of the body that was exposed uh, in the first place. And this can lead to extreme pain in the anus, the penis, the genitals, or the mouth. Um, it may make it very difficult to pee or to use the bowels. Um, it's also very concerning when these lesions are near the eye because we worry about eye involvement. The symptoms usually come on seven to 14 days after the, an exposure, but they can, it can occur as soon as five days or as long as 21 days after the exposure. And individuals remain infectious for two to four weeks. Um, it, you have to have all the skin lesions completely heal over before the chances of you passing it to someone else um, have, have uh, subsided. And so at Cal and Lord, we've, uh, we've had around 75 probable cases. So far, 28 are confirmed, and we're waiting for the results on another 40. Um, so there's a lot of concern uh, within the community about this. And... You know, the most important thing right now is to get informed and know what to look for. And uh, we're going to talk more about other measures uh, as we go through. So what are some of the ways to prevent monkeypox? Uh, we, we know that it could happen um, by sex, having sex, but what, what is having no sex the, the answer to this? What is the answer to preventing being infected? And this could be for anyone. Uh, I'm happy to answer this. Um, so because monkeypox is uh, 
frequently transmitted through close contact with infected skin, the best way to reduce transmission is really to not be in physical contact with other people who are actively infected. So in general, it can take up to three weeks for a newly infected person to develop symptoms and have resolution. So I would advise um, delaying sexual activity with a new partner, and then also having communication with anyone that you're having in your close physical circle, um, asking to whether or not they've been in any high risk um, situations or been around anyone who's potentially had monkeypox. Um, I think really avoidance, similar to how we initially treated the COVID-19 pandemic, is the best strategy as we're trying to get our hands around um, how many people are infected and how far the, um, this particular outbreak has spread. So what would you define as safe sex now? I can also answer that. Um, so wearing condoms is theoretically could decrease the risk of the severe anal symptoms that you know, we have heard about tonight. Um, but since people can have monkeypox lesions on any part of their body, as well as the, um, the viral particles can get into bed sheets and towels and other things like that, the, the most safe way is really a avoidance of close intimate contact with people um, who may have been sexually active with others. I'd advise that you try to decrease your circle um, and really try to have sexual contact with um, a limited number of individuals and hopefully people who are also only having sex with you. And this might be another question for you actually, but uh, at the beginning of this, there was talk about uh, people who have a larger network of sexual partners. And we were talking a little bit offline about it uh, possibly starting to go into smaller networks or a uh, person like in Fernando's case who only has one partner. Can you talk a little bit about maybe the migration of it instead of it being to these larger groups of sexual networks to smaller groups? Absolutely, that's the scariest part of this particular infection. And in, in my opinion, it's driven by the long lag time from when people um, are potentially infected and then um, essentially develop symptoms. Um, up to three weeks is a really long time. And so someone who is in these higher risk activities might have a single partner that who's not necessarily in those type of activities. And so uh, as we move through this, more and more people who are not going to these high risk places, high risk places are likely going to become infected. And so that's why I think it's important for everyone who's sexually active to have really um, broad conversations with your partners, um, learn as much as you can so that you um, can keep the risk down for everyone in the community. I wanna to get to Dr. Vassan. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the current infection rates in the city. What is that right now? What are we looking at? Yeah, thanks for the question. Let me just say two things first. Um, I'm very mindful of who I am in this space. You know, I'm a cis man, I'm a heterosexual man in this space, talking about something that's really important and intimate and painful as Fernando was so brave in describing for men who have sex with men and uh, trans people um, so I just want to name that and really say that first, because I, I, I recognize that limitation and I recognize that contradiction. Um, you asked a question about testing or about case rates. Unfortunately, the word rate is sort of impossible to um, tell you right now because we're just not doing enough testing as a nation to really understand how this virus, how much this virus is actually transmitting. What we have are case numbers. And right now in New York City, we have 389 cases, and that's over 30% of the cases, recorded cases uh, in the country. Uh, you know, I'm glad and I'm optimistic that testing will increase over the coming days and weeks because two commercial labs are now online. The Mayo Clinic is now online. So there are more options for clinicians who are testing their patients to now send lab uh, send specimens directly to labs to get results rather than going only through the public health lab or the public health departments, which 
aren't really set up for this large scale clinical testing. We really rely on our healthcare system and high throughput clinical testing for um, more results. As we've seen with COVID, we had to build we had to build that infrastructure in order to do that much testing. So um, that's where we are. We are certainly the epicenter of the epidemic here in the United States, um, and which is why we've been calling, of course, for more and more support from our federal partners. Is there concern with the health department at the health department that the numbers that you currently have as presumed monkeypox cases are undercounted because of the time that it takes for a person to realize that they're infected. Do you think that the actual numbers are much higher than they are right now? And we, we as you said, we don't have the testing right now to get out in the infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, I'm an epidemiologist as well as a physician, and this is the most frustrating position to be in, which is to not have enough testing to really get your arms around the dimensions of an epidemic. And so whether we are, um, significantly underestimating or somewhat underestimating, I can't tell you, but I, I'm quite certain that the counts we have are an underestimate. Um, and that just to give you a sense, um, at the public health lab, you know, on the order of 85 to 90% of the specimens we're testing are coming back positive, right? So we don't really have enough. And that is because we're also testing people, you know, who, who are clearly fitting the criteria, but, but also we, we, it helps us to get negative testing to, to get our sense of, of, uh, of spread and our sense of, of the dimensions of this. So we are definitely underestimating this all across the country. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the vaccine rollout in the access? That's something that um, a lot of it has drawn the ire of a lot of uh, people trying to uh, trying to get the vaccine. And I, I've heard you talk about this, but just for the people who are, are tuned in today, can you talk a little bit about why we just went through COVID and there was an infrastructure that was created over the last two years for that? Why isn't insert a disease? and kind of do the same thing that COVID had? That's a lot of the questions that I'm seeing out there from people. And it's, it's a perfectly reasonable question. Um, to be perfectly honest, we just haven't had the time to even, we're still in COVID and we haven't really figured out how to adapt that infrastructure yet and to invest in it permanently in order for it to be applicable to these other, as you said, insert, condition X, Y, or Z, we, are, we have built our COVID response on the basis of emergency funds from the federal government. What we really need is a sustainable, well-funded, permanent public health infrastructure. But that said, um, look, there were glitches and failures in the initial rollout of vaccine here in New York City, technical glitches, um, rollout glitches that shouldn't have happened. And I publicly apologize for those, and I'll do so again here. I, we're, we're incredibly sorry for the experience that people have had on the website. We've just launched a new vaccination website, a stable one, which we're confident, which is built off of exactly that COVID um, appointment infrastructure. And that'll go live tomorrow at 6 p.m. with an additional 8,000 appointments. I think this should also not take our eye off the larger ball, which is that vaccine supply is extremely limited, extremely constrained all across this country. And especially here in New York, which is, as I've said earlier, the epicenter of the pandemic of the, we'll call it a pandemic because it is, but, but the epidemic here in the United States. And, um, you know, we have to keep pushing for more vaccine to come into the country. And then for an appropriate amount, a commensurate amount, a proportional amount to come to New York City in keeping with its status as the epicenter of the epidemic. And the last thing I'll say is, and, and I, I know that this isn't a time for at all of pride in any way, but I don't think we'd be here talking about this in this way if it wasn't for New York City getting out the door in June with the initial doses. We pushed the federal government forward in really meaningful ways to develop a national vaccination strategy, a national testing strategy. These are not things that were sitting on the shelf waiting for us. This was stuff that had to be developed 
um, through a lot of advocacy, a lot of partnership. And it's because we set the pace on that. We've made mistakes. We own those mistakes. We're going to do better going forward. And we cannot, we cannot manufacture vaccine here. And what we really need is plenty more vaccine so we can get it to people who need it. A quick question about getting the vaccine uh, before I move on to who should be getting the vaccine is, are there conversations right now with the federal government about the allocation and the proportionate allocation for New York if New York has 30% of the cases right now? Absolutely. Um, the mayor and I talked to uh, the HHS secretary and other officials, the CDC director, um, just a couple of days ago. Um, my staff is actively partnering with the CDC and folks at HHS to advocate for this, to understand their calculations for why we're getting underpowered. Um, you may notice that the CDC website doesn't reflect the actual case numbers here in New York City or in New York State overall. So we've got work to do with our federal partners. We're grateful for all that they're doing and trying, but we need more. We need more from them. We need more from um, the administration to get us powered up to respond because I can build the best vaccination infrastructure. I can build the best website. I don't have vaccine. I don't have enough vaccine to get to people in an urgent way, in an equitable way. And so we're doing, the, we're doing what we can with what we have. And it's not good enough um, for the demand we're seeing. You know, clearly New Yorkers want this protection. Our appointments are getting snapped up the last time we rolled out in 10 minutes, uh, thousands of appointments. I assume similar thing will happen tomorrow. I hope it'll, it will be certainly more stable. Um, but, you know, we, we just need more vaccine right now. Yeah. And who should be getting this vaccine? Um, is it still uh, a, a person who has multiple sex partners or are you, is it someone who could be at risk maybe down the line? And this could be open for anyone. I don't know, it, you might be the best person to answer this, but it could be open to anyone. Well, let me at least talk about the, eligi the current eligibility criteria because in an environment of extremely limited supply, we have to establish some eligibility criteria for who can get it first. And we are starting and we have started with known exposures. So people who have a known documented exposure to someone who's tested positive with monkeypox. That's called PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis. And we've been doing that since the first cases uh, appeared in the city a couple of months ago. Um, and those have been relatively, I mean, as we said, to the 389 um, cases. And so you, you, through contact tracing and um, field epidemiology, we're really trying to give those people access to PEP. Then we launched an extended PEP program to try to get people who are at high risk of getting or transmitting um, monkeypox and people who would be at high risk for a severe outcome if they were to get monkeypox as well. And so currently that is gay, bisexual, or other men who have sex with men, including um, transgender and gender non-conforming or gender non-binary people, ages 18 and older, who have had multiple anonymous sex partners in the last 14 days. Um, I wanna open it up to the other panelists about the vaccine. Does the vaccine protect from getting uh, monkeypox from severe illness or a hospitalization and death? Um, what, what does the vaccine do in terms of protection? I can speak a little to that. Um, certainly in terms of after an exposure, if you can get the uh, vaccine within uh, four days, it does a good job of preventing you developing uh, the, the, the infection. And even after four days and before 14 days, it will do a lot to prevent uh, the more severe uh, uh, type of uh, presentation. 
Now, do you still get the virus if you're if you have the vaccine and you uh, come into contact and you're exposed? Do you still get the the virus? Well, I, I, I was uh, describing like after an exposure, uh, if you're doing it to prevent infection going forward, the, the full benefit of the vaccine is only, I believe, in uh, uh, effective two weeks after the second dose. Um, so we're a little less clear about prior to that, how much protection it affords. If I could just uh, jump in also, um, so we have clinical trial data about this two-dose vaccine called Genios, um, and that is clinical trial data from West Africa, and that shows that the two-dose regimen is around 85% effective at preventing acquisition, so preventing you from getting monkeypox. So that, would you... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. Uh, what I meant to say is um, there's another vaccine out there, an older technology called ACAM 2000. That's a, we're not advocating for that product, even though it's also an effective product, it has other complications and side effects. But interestingly, a one dose regimen of Genios seems to be e equivalent to the level of protection achieved by the one dose regimen of the ACAM 2000. So we're actively exploring both here in the city and nationally, of whether in an environment of very extreme supply limitations, whether we should move temporarily at least to a one dose regimen as other countries have done in their own supply, with their own supply limitations. So would you recommend even after someone is fully vaccinated to be vigilant? Certainly, certainly. Um, and as Dr. Meacher said, Full protection according to the FDA guidelines is not achieved and the clinical trial data is not achieved until two weeks after the second dose. But certainly there's a, there is protection that you, pretty significant protection that you get after the first dose. But we've talked a lot about vaccination, but the messages that Dr. Sandling was giving are, are incredibly important about primary prevention. What are the steps we can take? What are the steps individuals can take to keep themselves safe, to keep their partners safe, to keep those around them safe. And, and I think Dr. Sandling did a really good job of explaining some of those. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about risk and transmission. Um, what is the risk if you have HIV? Is it easier to get sick or sicker? And this is open to anyone. Yeah, um, so we don't have a lot of good data about this, but what it seems to be is that people living with HIV, if they have a suppressed um, you know, viral load and their T cells are high, they generally do really well. I think we should be a little bit more concerned about folks who um, have you know, low T cells or, or have had a recent you know, HIV related um, illness. And, and, and for those folks, definitely, um, you know, if they show up, we are um, advocating that they get treated. So I think the important thing is to, you know, monitor your, your health, um, look for, you know, any uh, signs of, you know, monkeypox. For example, if you had a recent sexual encounter and you start noticing the bumps coming up or you have a fever and so forth, you know, see, see your medical provider because if you do have monkeypox, it, it is important to get uh, treated and to get treated early, especially if you have, um, maybe your immune system isn't, isn't so robust. I think we might have grazed upon this, but what about the risk of transmission for other queer people, cis women and transgender non-binary people? I can answer this. Um, so the, the biggest issue is just contact with someone who is actively infected. And so it really isn't necessarily the type of physical contact. Um, it's just that you are in close proximity. Um, you can have the lesions on your hands, on your chest, on your face, like it can be anywhere. And so really coming, the biggest issue is just coming in contact with um, those who are actively shedding the virus. And um, what, 
what is the risk? We kind of talked a little bit about this. This is a question that someone submitted uh, of the risk of, for somebody who's not sexually active right now, like in the case of um, uh, some, some people who might have um, maybe one person a month ago, but is not super sexually active. Should, should they seek the vaccine? I mean, at this stage, um, you know, we've we've set out as broad uh, a criteria for eligibility for the vaccine as we can in this environment of really constrained supply. I think in a world where we had more vaccine, we would look for ways to broaden the eligibility because we know that, I mean, as Dr. Sandling said, as Dr. Mitra said, anyone can get monkeypox. There is no nothing intrinsic about the virus nor nothing really intrinsic about the community. It just so happens that this old virus has entered a new community. And this outbreak seems to be largely, but not exclusively confined to it. But we're starting to see it break out. In France, we had our first two cases in children uh, just last week. And so these are, concerns we have, and this, which is why we're trying to get vaccination out to as many people as possible. And we're trying to advise people to take precautions about skin to skin contact. That kind of leads us to a question that someone else submitted about why has this become a queer issue and not a general population issue? I can answer this. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's not that it's necessarily a queer issue. I think we're just trying to focus on where the cases are and we're trying to bring the resources to where there's the most need. Um, at this current, um, similar to when we had the COVID outbreak, the first outbreak was in New York City. So they brought a lot of the resources, or some of the first outbreaks were in New York City. So a lot of the resources were brought to New York City and there was less so say, for example, in Mississippi because there was not as much there. I think it is appropriate to um, uh, bring the resources to the community that's most affected. Um, but as we see it um, spread out into the broader community, I think resources will go there in due time. Yeah. Um, a couple other questions we're having come in during our chat. Um, the big thing here is about education. And that was with COVID and it's with really any disease or an outbreak. Someone asked, um, how can LGBT leaders, businesses work with the city to get educational materials out and host events? Is there anything in the works right now? There's a lot already in the works and there's a lot um, planned. I, you know, one thing is, I don't know that we've done a good job of telling the story about everything that's gone on, but even prior to Pride, we were tabling at bars, at clubs, at massage parlors, at spas, and we've ramped that up. We've also um, had a weekly roundtable with community leaders and community activists um, since really Pride, and we're we're, we're we'll be having an event, a larger event next week. Um, and we've had palm cards and information on our website that's downloadable, printable but also anyone can call the health department or email the department and request us to send them palm cards that they can distribute, which has really a lot of information on primary prevention. So what are the steps you can, the behavior you can take to, to keep yourself safe, but also more information about how to get access to um, vaccination and testing, testing and vaccination. Um, and so, um, yes, we, we have more to do. We have much more to do, but, um, you know, we, we are trying our best to partner with, with trusted organizations. It's also why, um, you know, a lot has been talked about the public side of the appointments that we've released, but we're also giving appointment slots directly to community organizations and community providers that treat the affected communities and that have longstanding relationships and trust and have built up that over decades and over time. Um, and that's the part that doesn't get told as much is because high risk people, people at risk people who, people who um, want to get the vaccine who are connected to community organizations can also 
connect to that community organization and get um, referred in for an appointment as well. And that will expand as vaccine supply expands. Now, I'm sure many people have heard the, the term being your own health advocate. Uh, someone submitted a question saying, uh, how can, what can you do if uh, you contact your doctor and they refuse to test or treat you, uh, or if you're misdiagnosed, what are the options that people have and where can people go right now to get tested and uh, be their own health advocate? I mean, I think the first call has to be to call your provider. If you have a provider that you trust, um, we're doing a lot of work with provider education. Uh, we've sent out a bulletin to over 100,000 providers across the city um, to educate them about what to look out for, what to test for, how to do the test, um, where to send it, who to call, all of that. Um, if you don't have a provider, you can call 311 and search the NYC or, and or search the NYC health map at nyc.gov backslash health backslash map and find a provider. We can also help you connect to a provider on 311. Um, and tell your provider openly that you're concerned about monkeypox. Um, and, you know, the good news is that there isn't a, really a specialized test or test kit for monkeypox that they should be comfortable sending uh, a specimen. Um, you know, and, and I think one of the also one of the difficulties that people uh, may not know is that you have to take a specimen from a lesion. And so that can be cumbersome, that can be difficult. And also that the clinician has to, um, you know, sanitize the room for transmission after seeing someone to avoid transmitting to the next patient. And so as we start to see like issues around appointments with clinicians, that's, those are all playing into it. Um, but folks should call their provider first, call 311 if they need help. Um, they can walk in to any New York City health and hospitals clinic or one of our sexual health clinics um, to get to get evaluated as well. Yeah, and I'm kind of jumping around between the questions and the Q&A as well as questions that have already been submitted. But one question that I'm seeing a lot is, is monkeypox related to chicken pox? And if you've had chicken pox, are you protected? I can jump in. Peter, why don't you jump in? I'm going to stop talking. Uh, I was just going to say it's actually a slightly different category of, of virus than chickenpox. Uh, as Dr. Radix mentioned, it is uh, more in the cowpox, smallpox family. Um, one thing that is uh, does appear to have uh, uh, some validity is that uh, people who were born before 1972 may have some protection from smallpox vaccine that was fairly ubiquitous before then. Um, but it's not actually in the same category as, as chickenpox. And what is testing like? Uh, I, I'm kind of jumping back and forth, but uh, is it a swab? How long does it take to get results? I, I, I've been reading that the, um, the testing is ramping up and there are, uh, you, you are reaching out to other sources to help with testing. So can you talk a little bit about that uh, for anyone who's, who would be able to talk about it? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, it's been a little variable how long the tests take. Uh, now that the commercial labs have them, we've been assured that the turnaround will be four days. So longer than we'd like, but at least that's a reliable sort of uh, a useful um, timeline that uh, is meaningful. The actual collection of the swabs uh, is fairly straightforward, but of course we do have to make sure our healthcare workers are, are wearing the right PPE that um, does prevent any risk of a healthcare worker uh, becoming infected. And I believe there's only ever been one case of a healthcare worker um, becoming infected, and that was through not wearing the appropriate PPE. So, uh, yeah, I hope that answered the question. And there are a lot of questions about contracting the virus. Um, I see a lot of people are asking about getting it on public transportation or shaking hands. Is that a low risk or is it uh, a higher risk place? 
I'm I'm comfortable saying that those are lower risk activities. Um, shaking someone's hand, you know, it is skin to skin contact, but it has to be relatively prolonged skin to skin contact. It's not brushing by someone or or touching someone's hand. You know, we're not we're not advocating for the avoidance of physical contact altogether. We're advocating for um, sensible and discretionary use of close physical prolonged contact, including sex. Um, and so, uh, and, and as far as transmission on a subway, um, fairly unlikely. It really hasn't been documented that it can live on surfaces uh, for long periods of time. Um, the only thing that we know is that it, it can pass through on clothes and on linens in particular. Um, but again, there has to be enough virus shed onto those linens and that usually that's through close prolonged contact. Um, back to the vaccine, someone asked, what does the, the country have to do to push for more vaccine supply? My understanding is that um, the company that makes it can't do a bulk supply right now because they're undergoing renovations. Um, some are wondering why can't you make the vaccine here? Why is it only um, at this one company in Europe? Yeah, well, that's, I mean, there are a lot of layers to that question. I, all I can say is that I do know that folks are working hard to get more vaccine into the country quickly. And I know that there are at least a couple of shipments, large shipments that are um, due to arrive in the coming weeks, which I hope will do some good in reducing the mismatch that we currently have between supply and demand. Um, as far as production of it, you know, that's a little out of my scope, but I know this much that the world has not really had a monkeypox plan. And that's largely because we've allowed it to become endemic in West Africa. And we've allowed it to become an endemic in West Africa because of structural racism. And that we've seen that over and over again in global health, that diseases over there are not our problem, which is why this country didn't have a robust stockpile of vaccines and it didn't have a clinical test approved that could be done quickly because we didn't think it would be here other than in a rare event of maybe weaponization or bioterrorism. But I think the world has shown that these, you know, things, we, we are too connected for that to be the case that we cannot address global health issues and expect them to stay off our shores. And so we're all in this together in some, in some deep and connected way. We are approaching time. I want to go through each panelist real quick with uh, the one thing that they want people watching to know, uh, the one bit of information. I think let's start with you, Dr. Bassan. I just want to say um, to everyone listening, um, number one, I share your urgency. I share your commitment to seeing us slow this down. And I understand your frustration. I'm frustrated too. Um, I want us to have more of the tools available to us. And I'm frustrated that there have been even glitches in using the tools we have. So frustration is definitely what I'm feeling. I'm hopeful that things will improve and stabilize over the coming weeks so that people can get access to the tools that they need. Um, I, I ask people um, in the face of that supply constraint to keep themselves safe by taking some sensible precautions like the ones uh, described earlier um, and you know, take care of one another as well. Dr. Meacher. Uh, thank you, yes. I think in addition to the things mentioned about just being vigilant, look, checking yourself out and if you notice anything, seeking help so you can get treatment. Um, and doing practical things just to lower uh, your risk, uh, e even if it is just having sex with the light on instead, so you can uh, take a look at your partners, um, uh, that might be helpful. But uh, Callanord is advocating in coalition with other LGBT organizations um, to really increase access to treatment and vaccine to fight uh, monkeypox. Um, this scarcity is really driving inequity, especially amongst LGBT communities and communities of color. 
And the scarcity is, is so especially acute in New York City where we have, I've heard 25, but I heard earlier 30% of the cases nationally and yet only 11% of the vaccine. So this is a huge advocacy issue that uh, many of us are really uh, committed to, to fighting um, to get more vaccine and more treatment so that we can move uh, through this. Dr. Radix. Yes, I think I echo everything that's been said. I also wanted to, to mention one other thing, which is there is treatment, but the treatment is currently only available in a research setting, which obviously limits how many people have access and who gets access. Um, I'll give you an example. The consent forms to access the treatment are only available in English. And uh, we really need to do better. You know, we, <laughs> we have to do a lot better at ensuring that people, um, everyone uh, can avail themselves of treatment if they need it. Um, but yes, enjoy the summer, uh, you know, but be careful monitor yourselves and if you do get monkeypox you know know that there there is treatment available if you need it but also please inform your sex partners so that they can get vaccinated dr Stanley. yes i want to echo everything that uh, my colleagues have said and really it's just space and time which is the biggest way to combat most infectious diseases um, it's, it typically will spread from one person directly to the next person. So if we're able to extend the time between people's contact, as well as extend the space between them, um, we can greatly slow down this, this very um, concerning epidemic. And Fernando, anything you want to share? Well, actually, I have a question. I don't know if it's possible to ask. I know it's, we're running out of time, but it's a good question that nobody brought up this past hour. May I ask for, to the doctors? Uh, yeah, let's go. Okay, thank you. So in my case, and people who were already infected with monkeypox, like myself, what's next? Am I immune? Um, is it possible to get infected again? Should I get the vaccine? It's a very good question, Fernando. Thank you. And I think uh, one of the one of the maxims, one of the sort of things that I try to hold to, is a little bit of biologic humility. And and I don't actually think we know the answer to this. Now, um, you've been infected. You're recovering, and Correct. you should have some immunity and antibodies. Mm -hmm. But that's not the same as the antibodies generated by a vaccine in terms of both the strength or the length. And that's just a general rule of infection versus vaccination. But um, I think it's a really good question, Fernando, and I don't think we know the answer. Thank you. Thank you. I got, got one more and it's pretty quick also. I don't think you have the answer for this, but I wanna bring it up. So um, I think Dr. Peter Mishu was saying that the incubation time can be up to 14 days. So if a person gets infected with monkeypox, and the first, let's say, the first seven to 10 days, this person shows no sign of infection, meaning there's no rush, there's no physical symptoms. Is this person at this point contagious? Can he give uh, monkeypox to somebody even though there's no rush, there's no symptoms, but he already has the virus in his body? Can he give it to somebody else? Fernando, I think you should come work for us at the health department because <laughs> you're, you're asking great questions. I, unlike COVID, which has very clear asymptomatic spread, meaning spread when you don't have symptoms as you just described, Correct. I don't think that that's very clear with monkeypox. That right now, at least as of now, there really isn't any clear transmission for people who haven't displayed symptoms. There's some reports that it might be possible in some of the European cases but it's really not clear at the moment, which is why we're just encouraging anyone to take basic precautions. I think Dr. Sandling said it well, um, space and time. Um, and so, so that, that's the best advice. I just wanna end by, at least my part, by saying thank you to Cal and Lord. Um, you know, the health department has partnered with Cal and Lord for years, and we consider you all uh, an incredible ally and incredible partner um, in, care, treatment, support, 
and advocacy for the LGBTQ community. And so we're very grateful for your partnership. Yes, thank you, Cal and Lord, for putting this together. You know, there were a lot of questions that we didn't get to. I want to once again remind people that those questions that were submitted in the chat um, will be compiled. Um, the Cal and Lord will be compiling all the questions to create really a comprehensive FAQ as a follow up to, to this event. So keep tabs on the website, on their social media at Cal and Lord on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, once again, thank you to our panelists for being here for this very educational uh, production um, and have a good night, everyone. Thank you, good Thank night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.